Hey there, church family. Welcome to a new video series on inspiring stories from church history. My name is Thomas Fiorini, for those of you who don't know me. And today, we'll be digging into some of the earliest stories we have from after the conclusion of the New Testament. Stories of the early Christian martyrs. Now, today's video is a bit different because we'll be taking the time to discuss two different figures, each with their own stories. Normally, we'll be focusing on just one person in each video, but there are just so many great accounts of early Christian martyrs that one simply wouldn't cut it for today. So let's begin with the story of a man named Polycarp. Polycarp was born around AD 69 and was raised a Christian, which means his parents had likely been converted by the missionary work of the apostles. In fact, according to Polycarp, the person who discipled and mentored him in the faith was none other than the Apostle John. As an adult, Polycarp became a key elder of the church at Smyrna, a city in modern-day Turkey which is mentioned by the Apostle John among the seven churches addressed in Revelation, chapters 2-3. through three. Many later writers would refer to Polycarp as the Bishop of Smyrna, but this is an anachronistic term meaning that it's an imposition from the perspective of a later period. In Polycarp's day, the Christian churches were still following the New Testament model of having multiple elders in charge of a single congregation, each with unique responsibilities, and no one person in charge of the whole church or of a district of churches. If churches in a region had a dispute to resolve, they would send representatives from their elders to a council to hash out the issue together, but otherwise, there was no single governing figure. So we have a few records of Polycarp's ministry as an elder of Smyrna. One thing we know he did is journey to Rome, where he tried to settle a dispute with the Western churches over the proper date on which to celebrate Easter. And they reached a peaceable agreement where Eastern churches and Western churches would continue to celebrate Easter on different days as before. They decided essentially that it wasn't an issue worth fighting over. While in Rome, however, Polycarp confronted a well-known heretic named Marcion, who was claiming that Jesus Christ had not truly been human and that the Old Testament was not inspired scripture. So in contrast to his friendly debate with the Roman church, Polycarp had no patience for someone who was teaching anti-Christian lies, and he dismissed Marcion as, in his words, a firstborn son of Satan. Now, we also have a letter which Polycarp wrote to the church in Philippi, in which he cites from the majority of the books of the New Testament and encourages them to live righteously, to maintain unity, and to stay true to the faith, avoiding heresy. Now, when Polycarp was 86 years old, the Roman authorities in Smyrna decided that they had had enough. It's not exactly clear why they had waited until this point, but what we do know is that while the Christians were often disliked by the Romans or viewed with great suspicion, the actual persecution of Christians under Rome was not constant. It came in waves. Certain emperors were more tolerant of Christians, while other emperors made it their agenda to kill as many as possible. And moreover, the persecution was often localized, as there was a great deal of political freedom given to the, the governors of the Roman districts to do as they saw fit in their region. Uh, so there were several waves of persecution, right? It came and it went, up until the time of Constantine in the 4th century, when Christianity was finally legalized. So with that in mind, what we do have are many of the other details surrounding Polycarp's martyrdom. The church in Smyrna wrote down the account less than a year after Polycarp had died, and this is the first martyrdom of which we have written record after those recorded by Luke in the Book of Acts. So at the request of his congregants, Polycarp hid in an estate in the countryside outside of Smyrna, while the Romans searched for him. While there, he had a dream, which convinced him that it was his time, and, the, and, and that he must be burned at the stake. After torturing a young man, a young boy from the church, 
the Romans learned of Polycarp's whereabouts and went and arrested him. Polycarp went without a fight. At his interrogation with the local proconsul, Polycarp refused their demands that he denounce Christ and pour out an offering of worship to Caesar. When the proconsul urged him again to denounce Christ, Polycarp replied, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? When the proconsul threatened him with being thrown to the beasts and burned by fire, Polycarp answered, You threaten the fire that burns for an hour and in a little while is quenched, but you do not know of the fire that is of the judgment to come and the fire of the eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. But why do you delay? Do as you will. Basically, come at me. <laughs> at this point, the proconsul sent Polycarp to be burned. When the soldiers attempted to nail him to the pyre, which is the stake where a person is burned, he told them, let me be as I am. He that granted me to endure the fire will grant me also to remain at the pyre unmoved without being secured with nails. They lit the fire and he remained without stepping, on, stepping out of it. However, the bystanders saw the fire take a strange shape around him and it did not consume his body. So to counter this, the executioner ran him through with a dagger. And as he was dying, those watching saw a dove come out of him and so much blood spilled out that it quenched the fire. Though needless to say, the people of Smyrna were talking about this event for quite some time, and many came to faith in Christ because of it. Now, you might think that this story is an anomaly or the tale of a particularly exceptional believer, yet stories like this are abundant in the early church. The martyrs were given special honor in the church, it is true, but the Christians knew that, it, that any of them could easily be martyred at any time. The training given for church membership included preparation for this. So as I mentioned, today we have a second story as well, two for the price of one. Our second tale today is the account of a young woman named Perpetua. Perpetua was likely born around AD 182, less than 30 years after Polycarp's death, and she lived in Carthage in modern-day Tunisia in northern Africa. Carthage was a vibrant Christian community, community, and since the Roman emperor had decided he wanted to start cracking down on these Christians, who were viewed as unpatriotic and dangerous since they refused to worship Roman gods, he naturally focused much of his efforts on North Africa. Not much is known of Perpetua's life before her martyrdom, except that she seems to have been a woman of the upper class. And this is not surprising, since not only did the number of women in the early church somewhat exceed the number of men, but many of the women involved were from the upper classes, and many of the men involved were from the lower classes. However, <clears throat> we do have a first-hand account of the circumstances leading up to Perpetua's death, written by Perpetua herself in her diary. Having been arrested with four other catechumens, which refers to new converts, who were preparing to receive baptism, one of whom was her servant, Felicity. These five were imprisoned while awaiting their execution. While in the prison, Perpetua records receiving several dreams which, with symbolism which instructed her that she was going to die in the upcoming days, but that she would be welcomed into heaven, and that by her death she would be demonstrating victory over the power of the devil. At one point, her father, who was a pagan, visited her in prison and pleaded with her to deny Christ so that she'd be set free. He pointed out that Perpetua was young, about 21 or 22 years old, and that her family loved her and that she had a young son at home whom she was still nursing. Her response was to point at a jar nearby and ask her father if it would be possible to call it anything other than a jar. He replied that it was not. Oh, well, she said, then neither can I be called 
anything other than what I am, a Christian. When he visited her again to plead with her yet another time, she responded that she was in God's hands and that all would be done according to his will. Later during her trial, her father burst into the courtroom and started pleading with her one more time to deny being a Christian, but she refused. At this point, the Roman governor condemned her to death. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so they sent her to the arena, along with Felicity and the others, where a crazed cow was released, which proceeded to hit and throw and trample on them. At one point, Perpetua's hair was knocked loose, which was a sign of mourning in their culture, and she quickly tied it up again to show that she was joyfully looking ahead to her reward. The crowd, however, began to grow impatient and called for their deaths. So restraining the cow, the soldiers approached with swords drawn. Perpetua and Felicity said goodbye to each other with a kiss of peace. And moments later, they were executed there in the arena. These stories <clears throat> of Polycarp and Perpetua have served as a powerful inspiration and encouragement for many believers throughout church history. They show the importance of maintaining supreme allegiance to Christ and of keeping one's focus on the promised inheritance in Jesus, despite opposition from the powers of this world. We might not live in a place which experiences such persecution in the present day, but such things are still happening around the world in other places where governing powers are hostile to Christianity. Well, we need to stand in solidarity with these brothers and sisters, praying like the apostles prayed in Acts 4, that they not give in to the pressure, but continue to preach and live out the gospel. Likewise, in our context, though always, though always defined by love, we must never pretend to be something other than what we are, Christians, followers of Jesus Christ and unable to be called by any other name. So, blessings on you all this week. I'll post some discussion questions on a slide here at the end. Feel free to use those with your family or in your small group or wherever. I'm praying that you are encouraged by these stories to keep, up, keep living out the faith. And I'll see you all next time.